Welcome to the Cinema Cartography. The relationship between the medium of video games and high art has always been a strenuous one. And if you live an intentional life of engaging with the highest icons of our culture, as well as attempting to bring such art to the forefront of people's minds, it becomes less difficult to see why. The medium of video games is an art form, and we hear time and time again from its engaging participants that they are to be considered as such. This is true. However, in order for such a notion to be reaffirmed by the wider art world, we must first consider one thing, that out of every art form that one can conjure, the medium of gaming, in its present state, is the most infantile, and on an aggregate scale, the least artful. How does one come to this conclusion? This isn't a critique on gaming's values, although one could certainly make an argument for that. We're talking exclusively within the realm of its artistic philosophy. Consider first the prestige of highly esteemed works of art. Think of the paintings of Jan van Eyck, Michelangelo's sculptures. Include contemporary examples, the films of Mikael Haneke, or the activist work of Ai Weiwei. There is, across these various forms, a commonality between them. Alongside the message that they aim to transmit, it's their methodology and practice that's intrinsic to their conveyance. The films of Mikael Haneke discuss the uses of technology and its relation to the breakdowns of communication in society. Therefore, in order to discuss this new societal impersonality, he presents his works emphasizing the voyeuristic gaze of us as viewers, similar to how so much of our life presents information to us, streamed through screens and bypassing the human element. Michelangelo's sculpture of the biblical character David depicted him in a way never presented before. Rather than the gallant or heroic depiction after his victory of Goliath, we see a David prior to the battle. His look is one that's inward and pensive. This for Michelangelo was the epitome of man. The depiction of man as an ideal is the one not only of physical superiority, but one whose thought is prioritized over all else. These few examples take wildly different ideas and tell those stories through each medium. But storytelling is to take such a concept or an idea and through the means of your medium, create an abstraction outside of reality, wherein the full development of that abstraction is how that idea is transmuted. This is where we return to our more playful art form. Most video games tell stories of one form or another. There are some which are engaging and others where they are less so. However, disregarding the quality of the narratives for a moment, we must acknowledge that no matter the quality of stories within games, this is not the issue at hand. The issue is one specifically of storytelling. Video games rarely utilize the abstraction of what a game is to convey any kind of artistic suggestion to the player. To give a further example, let's look at some highly regarded video games of recent memory. The second highest selling video game of all time is Grand Theft Auto V. Now, GTA V is a game that follows three protagonists, of which you can switch between at any point in the game, even if they're in the middle of something. Now, this is a good example of a synthesis between storytelling and medium. The most differing aspect of the medium of games is the element of reciprocation. The person interacting with the game can decide and take the actions of the characters within the art piece. This is a very unique perspective, one that would be difficult to replicate in other forms. The player is given the ability to control various characters at any point within a narrative, with each character having a personality and style that's distinctly their own. Herein lies a storytelling problem. Because Grand Theft Auto is in effect a story-driven game, there will always be a limitation on the amount of freedom we have in crafting the character. We can choose to imprint our own personality traits on the character, but ultimately, the story must move at the pace it's already dictated. Regardless of how callous or righteous we make these people, the actual story will be delivered to us however it needs to be. We can't stop certain set pieces or decisions from being made. The result is that in a medium wherein the person interacting with it actually has an impact on the manner in which the art presents itself, 
it chooses not to highlight this unique form of expression. Instead, we see what is the crux of the majority of video game storytelling. It chooses to tell its story like a film. The parts that don't actually affect the story, you get to choose however you play them out. But the part where the narrative continues, you place the controller down and watch it with no input whatsoever. Novels, sculpture, painting, all utilize the abstractions of their form to offer unique experiences of what can even be the same story. Games have neglected their unprecedented spectrum of interactivity and opted for mimicry of the most accessible art form, for what I can only assume are reasons that delve no further beyond similarity. The idea that you could take the unlimited possibilities of storytelling within games and reduce it to such a finite degree displays that when it comes to telling stories, people are writing like movies. The movies themselves also often write reality like movies, however this is a discussion for another time. There have been attempts to remedy this approach in narrative. Many classic RPGs attempt to match the style of play with the path that the character takes. Features such as permadeath and blocking certain storylines or missions is a good way to mediate this. Others have attempted to make pure story games where the gameplay is secondary to the story that's being told. This harks back to the genesis of role-playing and games as a vessel for storytelling, the choose-your-own-adventure style. But these approaches have too varied in quality. But the majority of games fall somewhere in the middle, a place where narrative and gameplay exist in binary realms, very rarely crossing one another. Some games do have compelling and interesting stories on their own, however my issue lies in the fact that when it comes to games, good storytelling has become synonymous with cinematic. This is the antithesis of games. Cinema should not be within its realm, especially when idealized as the most triumphant thing a game could be. Not all games need to tell good stories. You can create art purely through the experience of a person inhabiting an artificial character and the mastery in how well you can convey atmosphere and other emotions through this. Resident Evil 4, Super Mario Galaxy, Tetris, Animal Crossing, Bayonetta, Halo, Chaos Theory, Doom, these are games that choose to tell as much or as little a story as possible, but prioritise the excellence in their experiences, which elevates them to levels we now see as the barometers of excellence. But when it comes to high art, we have to not only acknowledge the games that fit into this category, but understand precisely what it is that makes them so. And perhaps if we recognize this, our perception of the medium can be changed and re-evaluated for the better. This video is brought to you by Mubi, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. Try Mubi free for 30 days at mubi.com slash cinemacartography. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash cinema cartography for a whole month of great cinema for free. The nature of video games lies in the essence that there is a player conducting all of the goings on within the piece. Every piece of progression is a direct result of them. In one way you could think that all games are RPGs in that sense. However, based on the fact that there must be some finite limits within the possibilities of what a person can achieve within a game, then the freedom of choice that the medium of gaming must be hinged on will always be somewhat of an illusion. The notion of choice has been expanded upon in certain games. A game like Mass Effect has you making decisions that will alter your journey for the remainder of the game. Some characters that you've grown to become fond of their survival will come down to very drastic decisions that you make. Belay that. We can handle ourselves. Go back and get Williams. Williams, radio Joker and tell him to meet us at the bomb site. Yes, Commander, I... It's the right choice, and you know it, Ash. These are crossroads, decisions wherein the path onward diverges at a single point. This allows us to shape the journey in more salient ways. It allows the story to continue to be told in piecemeal chunks. If you actually analyse it, there are only a handful of variants due to the controlled number of these crossroad decisions. 
and thus the main narrative can continue to be told at its natural pace, simply replacing the specific variants with the A or B decision that emerge at each crossroad. How can you not see what this means to the Krogan? This base can't be destroyed. I won't allow it. These Krogan are slaves of Saren. Puppets. Tools to be used and discarded. If there were a handful of large decisions to be made, and each of those decisions had two divergences, you'd still be left with a manageable handful of variances in the narrative that you wouldn't lose control over. Most stories have to have a level of coherence, and in video games the idea of forging your own path is at the heart of the medium. However, video games striving towards making artistic pieces still require a degree of control from an artist. We think of developers and programmers when we think of the production and not creation of video games, but behind every individual journey that a player crafts are the individuals that designed it to be so. Within all of your virtual experiences, it's still ultimately their story. If they give the means to you of how to tell that story, then it's still the methodology of their art form. You have the power to free us, or return our people to the silence of memory. I won't destroy your entire race. You'll go free. An example of this we can see more in Telltale's The Walking Dead. The construction of choice here is less pertinent. The game disguises its choices through gameplay. Many of its choices pile on top of one another based on the way that you interacted with your world. We should go. The motel's run its course, and it's not safe. You're damn right it has. We pile into the RV and don't pull over till we see water. And if Lily's dead set on staying, then, well, that's the way it goes. Characters will choose to stand by or desert you based on the culmination of your actions. In truth, this feels like a larger evolution than on occasional one-off decisions, because there's a complexity added to the weight of each action. You truly have to consider the results of your seemingly insignificant choices, mixing both emotion and rationality as opposed to an A or B scenario. You've always been there for me, Lee. Always had my back when it mattered. What kind of friend would I be if I wasn't there for you now? But the thing is, even with this network of choices that influence each other, in The Walking Dead, we're still left with the same finale for every single player. This isn't a detriment, but an example that even a game based on choice is still telling a singular story. So what's more important? To be able to alter a narrative giving the player the ability to completely reject the game's premise, or a malleable journey, where the core experience remains the same. What's exposed around both of these premises is that regardless of the choice, all choices in video games are an illusion. And perhaps the game that best utilises this within its storytelling is Bioshock and Bioshock Infinite. Was a man sent to kill, or a slave? A man chooses, a slave obeys. Examining the world of Infinite, we see how the game offers varying instances of choices that appear to hold severe weight, making you question the right course of action. However, in all of these decisions, we learn that they make no difference whatsoever. We just believe they do. Look at these, they're amazing! Which one do you like more, this one or, or this? The bird is beautiful and the cage is somber, but there's really something special about it. This approach is intrinsic in order to convey the rest of the story. A story wherein we learn how our main protagonist, Booker DeWitt, exists across multiple realities, as the infinite number of possibilities he was and could have been. No! No, no, no! Machine. No! Shut it Anna. down! Shut down Anna. the machine! Now do it! Give me back my daughter! No! The narrative and messages being that choice does matter, but regardless of the choice that was made, in some ethereal, perhaps even emotional plane, the alternate possibility still exists in this world. Look. It's us. 
Not exactly. They swim in different oceans, but land on the same shore. And it always starts with a lighthouse. I, I don't understand. We don't need to. It'll happen all the same. Why? Because it does. Because it has. Because it will. On the ocean of our subconscious. For the consideration of any choice meant that for a brief moment, that decision was lived and inhabited. Does that not make it real? What did he mean? Huh? You tell me, what did he mean about my finger? I don't know. I... I just assumed you were born with it. I, I don't know. Your nose. It's bleeding. It exists somewhere, perhaps in a lighthouse on the sea. The choice has always been at the heart of Bioshock. In its originator, it utilizes the philosophy of Ayn Rand's objectivism and measures it against the ethos of gaming and morality within the medium. I rejected those answers. Instead, I chose something different. I chose the impossible. I chose rapture. For one facet that will always negate morality in gaming is the search for power. The game is set in the city of Rapture, wherein the tenets of individuality are valued above all else, but it appears that same rampant selfishness causes the chaos which results in the very downfall of the city. <laughs> The denizens disregard one another in their search for power, just as paradoxically, we are looking to critique this mindset, yet in a video game, what must we do? We too must disregard others in order to gain power, to achieve an objective, however arbitrary. Is there thus a possibility that someone was to disregard others so much that it would be possible that they could create a system in which they can physically establish people's existence as an illusion of choice? Well, in Bioshock, that's precisely the case. Not only shown through the goals of the antagonist, but the very perspective of the creators of the game. The only way to complete the game in Bioshock is to accept the limitations of choice. In essence, to obey the kind of artistic tyranny the game has to impose on you. It's profound ideas of liberation for the players existing, yet forever intertwined in a state of control. The choices we can make in certain games are often free for us to make, but even the choice of absolute failure, of absolute destruction of narrative, is first and foremost a choice from its creators, and its implication in the world of Bioshock is understood in its totality as a perfect form of storytelling. You've come to wipe your slate clean, false chef. But time will walk backwards before you find redemption. Some sins can't be forgiven. Oftentimes the greatest games have some manner of awareness of the medium that they're communicating through. As a result, they aim perhaps even inadvertently towards discussing the very medium itself. But herein, we discover a dichotomy. Aristotle discussed in his Poetics the notion of catharsis, that the purpose of tragedy is to purge the audience of its feelings, whether it be fear, anxiety, or hatred, to experience something without truly inhabiting it, thus returning us to our emotional equilibrium. But how could this relate to video games? 
Isn't there a glaring problem evident in its very name? Games. Aren't games supposed to be fun? Even I value some of the greatest pieces of the medium simply based on the efficiency of these most pragmatic terms. But is it right? Could it even be deemed successful if a game were to not be enjoyable? If an artist aimed to abstract the realities of humanity, that must inevitably involve the quintessential shadow of humanity. And regarding the one artistic medium that depends on human to virtual correspondence, that would mean that in order to delve into these gruesome troves, the player must also experience some replication of its character's torment. We all understand the joy of high octane action, especially if the conduit for that action is a player, someone who's instigating and engaging in grandiose set pieces very few people could ever have the opportunity of having. In many ways, we can look at this also as an element of Aristotle's catharsis. However, is there not an unintentional degree of dishonesty here? Examining the prominent Call of Duty and Battlefield franchises, both base their settings in fictional and real-life conflicts throughout history. They're the most famous instances of games attempting to showcase the horrors of war, most notably through their attempts of pushing the barriers of realism, taking military-grade knowledge and applying it in the games. The weapons, the language, the procedures, they're all based in what it's like to be a soldier. But is being a soldier fun? When we think of the responsiveness of controls, the constant sense of reward given by Twitch shooters, there's a massive prioritization on giving the player a sense of power. Even in death, the load times between being killed and running around again is minute. You have to return immediately to the battlefield and earn your reward. That reward is more killing. There's a detachment at play here. In aiming to craft a more realistic experience, the creators of these kinds of games have in fact developed the exact opposite, turning war into something playful. We're only questioning, is this a good thing? Let's look at one game in which being fun is not the priority. Spec Ops The Line. This is Colonel John Conrad, United States Army. Has the evacuation of Dubai ended in complete failure. Death toll. Now, if you were to look and play Spec Ops, you would assume you would be playing a bang average third person military shooter, one of the dozens you can find anywhere. It plays rather sluggish, the weapons aren't memorable, and it engages in all the tropes and cliches you'd expect of the genre. It opens on a large on rails set piece. It offers nothing to the cover and shoot mechanics that have become almost second nature to the genre. But why is this important? Because this methodology is entwined with the story that Spec Ops tells. The story is based on Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, in which a man is sailing up the Congo River to meet Kurtz, a man that's established himself almost as a god amongst the natives. In Spec Ops, you play as Walker, a soldier journeying through a Dubai that's been destroyed by a deluge of sand. You journey to confront Conrad, a soldier gone AWOL, that's cast himself much akin to Kurtz as a new great leader. Rumor is Conrad was ordered to abandon the city. He defied that order, and the 33rd stood with him. You clunk through as the typical hero of the narrative until there's a tonal shift. There were over 5,000 people alive in Dubai the day before you arrived. How many are alive today? How many will be alive tomorrow? I thought my duty was to protect this city from the storm. I was wrong. I have to protect it from you. The game asks you to make choices, but as we know in discussing the very nature of choice, we don't actually have one. In Spec Ops, the idea of killing in a game is brought into question. Perhaps the most pertinent question being, why are we the players doing this? I tried. 1,300 men, women, children dead because of my arrogance. And now you want to finish off the rest? If you will not learn from my mistakes, then there's nothing more I can do. Throughout the journey, 
white phosphorus is used in order to forge a path, only to find we've burnt civilians alive. Are those... civilians? Where'd they come from? There's no camp here! They took them from the nest. That hotel back at the Stormwall? No, 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 those can't be the civvies that got kidnapped. It's not possible. We're ordered to decide which of two innocent people most deserve to die. Five innocent people are dead because these two animals couldn't control themselves. I get it. We're meant to choose. And within all of these sequences, we descend further and further down into the heart of darkness getting closer and closer to our own personal hell. I know you're listening, Colonel, so hear this. This war is over. Dubai will be evacuated. And you will be relieved of your command. The game fantastically uses geography, having us constantly descending downwards to the point where we should be below the planet's surface. The game's utilisation of hallucination and psychedelic sequences actually attempts to put us in the perspective of a soldier in war coping with PTSD. Uh. Walker! What are you doing? Adams? You can't do this, man! For all the atrocities that we witness anywhere else would just be another action set piece, another large spectacle for us to enjoy. The reality, however, couldn't be further. For what Spec Ops ultimately aims to show is the futility of aiming to create art in a medium based on the joy of violence. The game itself begins to present itself in ways that do not highlight its enjoyment. We become swept along for the ride, constantly moving forward, yet making the situations we're in worse and worse. In four days, this city will begin dying of thirst. Just like Riggs wanted. This is your fault, Walker. You did this, not me. The game reaches punishing levels that are bestowed on the player. And if this level of masochism wasn't enough, the game expands beyond its own limits, beginning to strip apart the device of the gaming world to converse with the player directly. Messages from the loading screens become more and more cerebral urging us to not only question our actions, but ultimately question if we want to be engaging with this at all. However, by persevering towards the game's finale, its messages come full circle. Walker is not a character, he is the player. His own broken psychology when it comes to the call of duty and to violence have been so warped that he invoked any reason at all so that he could engage with his acts of violence just like the players glamorising the death and carnage that war brings. Imagine the separation that has to occur, so that a player can feel the elation of a soldier completing a mission with no adverse effects whatsoever, all in the comfort of their own homes. And this is exactly who the game is talking to. From the very beginning, Spec Ops ensures that your name is present on the screen, that the characters talk and point directly to you because by reaching the end of Spec Ops, you're essentially punished for your actions. You engaged in violence because you wanted to engage in violence. You didn't have to put yourself through this. But what do we expect from games? To be rewarded, to receive achievements. The truth, Walker, is that you're here because you wanted to feel like something you're not, a hero. The storytelling of Spec Ops is something that must be acknowledged in the medium of games for it takes a protagonist whose psyche is compartmentalised because as people willing to accept the illusion of accomplishment that horrific games offer, we as players inhabit that very same mentality. I know the truth is hard to hear, Walker, but it's time. You're all that's left, and we can't live this lie forever. Marcel Duchamp brought to the art world the very significant and everlasting question of what is art. And as of right now, Spec Ops The Line is the crowning jewel when it comes to bringing that level of discussion to the realm of video games. Is enjoyability a crucial element of games? And if so, what are the limits of what constitutes enjoyment? After all, 
To kill for yourself is murder. To kill for your country is heroic. But to kill for entertainment is harmless. John? Is that you? You tell me. I'm done playing games, John. I assure you, this is no game. Games aim to put you directly in the seats of the so-called hero of the story, but very rarely do they either have them question your actions or truly try to translate the sensorial experience of feeling the emotion. They typically just display the emotion via the screen and you recognise that a character is feeling it. Rather than a synchronisation occurring between the virtual and the real, it's more akin to theatre. However, some pieces do try to go the extra mile in utilising the hardware and the medium of the form to instigate emotion. Eternal Darkness is perhaps the most infamous example of transmitting the theme of its story through its experience. A story dealing with the declining mental state of the character, you also undergo the same process in which the boundaries between the game world and our own collide, engaging in moments that legitimately make you question whether something you're seeing is planned or not. This is a unique facet in gaming, as playing with the hardware is a detail that makes the player ultimately helpless, and the game aims to redirect the player's focus to that mode of helplessness. Moving in and out of this degree of certainty is something that can in many ways be best achieved through video games. It's a feeling that can't be replicated in this manner through other mediums as we experience them in a linear fashion. The random quality and experiential facet of games makes this the ultimate method of emotional correspondence. Yet perhaps the most significant singular moment in all of video games in this sudden obliteration of hiding its artifice comes from the infamous Psycho Mantis battle from the original Metal Gear Solid. Ah, I can see into your mind. So, you like Suikoden. So, you like Azure Dream. You like Castlevania, don't you? It's an utter transgression of the role the player has, making the only way to solve the puzzle a feat that must be undertaken outside of the video game's reality. Playing with the hardware itself, making the experience somewhat exclusive to each player, Hideo Kojima, from the outset of his vision, was aiming to redirect the form of storytelling within the medium itself. And although the literal rumblings may have been felt in his initial outing into the Metal Gear series, this wouldn't be fully realised until Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty. Raiden, turn the game console off right now. What did you say? The mission is a failure. Cut the power right now. What's wrong with you? Don't worry, it's a game. It's a game just like usual. You'll ruin your eyes playing so close to the TV. In order to fully understand the storytelling of Sons of Liberty, one must understand the totality of what the second Metal Gear Solid game was. Its anticipation was insurmountable. It was a sequel to one of the most critically acclaimed games of all time, and it was to continue the story of a game which arguably changed the landscape of how stories were perceived in the medium, one which made them mature, convoluted, fused with real-world events, and featuring a new cult protagonist that was to become a mascot for the era. And from the game's announcement, there was a ubiquitous parade of demos and trailers only adding to the speculation and excitement. Why is this important? Because Metal Gear Solid 2 is a game that exists within the self-contained universe of a single game as well as an art piece that has reframed its context to examine itself from every conceivable angle. There's no such thing in the world as absolute reality. Most of what they call real is actually fiction. What you think you see is only as real as your brain tells you it is. This is a game of transgressions, perhaps the largest occurring around one to two hours into the game. The hero Solid Snake dies and the story diverges into a less intriguing, almost B-plot to the actual events that were just occurring. 
the hero of Shadow Moses? So that's why you changed my code name. Right, but he can't be the Solid Snake. He died two years ago on that tanker after he blew it sky high. The grizzled, charming snake has been replaced with the boyish, whiny smoke. Jack, or Raiden, a character who is left out of the loop of all information, complains, and even chastised by his girlfriend. If it weren't for that coincidence, we wouldn't be together. I know. I'm sorry, Jack. I'm taking up your time again. What? Take care. Just the experience of taking control of him is felt to be laborious. We undergo the same tutorial we had just been through, relearning things that were already taught to us as players. The pace of the game is immediately halted as we're suddenly catapulted into a state of confusion. To encapsulate the experience of the remainder of Sons of Liberty is that it essentially retreads all the same steps as the first Metal Gear Solid. Dead Cell replaces Foxhound, the character of Grey Fox re-emerges, and even the opening of Raiden's adventure is almost a beat-for-beat -beat retrace of how the original game began. For people that enjoyed the original Metal Gear Solid, they're likely to enjoy this, maybe even more. The gameplay is a good evolution, it features the remarkable attention to detail unseen in the medium, and the narrative, though again convoluted, is thought-provoking and allows you to question the canon of this world. The Patriots. Even I don't know who the actual members are. Are they financial, political, or military leaders? No one knows who the Patriots really are. Even my instructions come from a cutout. All I've been told is that every key decision is made by a group of 12 men, known as the Wise Men's Committee. But even with these successful points, something is missing. Why is Raiden so clearly inferior to Snake? Why is the game structured essentially as a retread of the first? This could be chalked up to some questionable design decisions. That is, until the final act of the game, when the facade that it's upheld shatters in one of the most disruptive moments in the history of the medium. Over the past 200 years, a kind of consciousness formed layer by layer in the crucible of the White House. It's not unlike the way life started in the oceans four billion years ago. The White House was our primordial soup, a base of evolution. We are formless. We are the very discipline and morality that Americans invoke so often. How can anyone hope to eliminate us? As long as this nation exists, so will we. So what is Sons of Liberty? Sons of Liberty came with the arduous task of fulfilling all of the baggage it brought along just by being what it was. Its aim was to fulfill the tasks of honouring, continuing and evolving what made the original Metal Gear the success it was by acknowledging all of these things while sidestepping them all at the same time. Metal Gear Solid 2 is a game that's built from a paradox. The story of the battle for freedom and equality against the powers of totalitarianism can never be fully realised in a medium wherein the objective path to glory is already mapped out by its invisible master. We're already being controlled just as much as Raiden is shown to be a puppet at the whim of his masters. That is, mission is to infiltrate the structure and disarm the terrorists. My role? Why do you keep saying that? Why not? This is a type of role-playing game. The point is that you play out your part, and I expect you to turn in a perfect performance. Colonel, I just remembered something. What? That I've never met you in person. Not once. Hmm. Complete your mission according to the simulation. And when it comes to the perception of what MGS2 was supposed to be, herein lies Kojima's philosophical arguments. The digital world is one built from the ground up on misinformation. The idea of truth is stewed together from the accumulation of half-truths and untruths. Eventually there is so much data to siphon through that objective truth no longer exists as it's not being preserved. And this new world that we find ourselves in is one wherein truth is created via the mass information. 
Who else could wade through the sea of garbage you people produce, retrieve valuable truths, and even interpret their meaning for later generations? That's what it means to create context. Just as the masses anticipated that MGS2 was to be a continuation of Solid Snake, our sensorial experience dictated that this was not the case. Even though for so long this was the truth, all of the previous trailers and the mass consumer knowledge told us that it was so, until eventually the culmination of these half-truths made that original truth no longer necessary, as though it never existed. I'm not sure. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between reality and a game. Diminished sense of reality, huh? VR training will do that. Just as the truth presented for the majority of the game was shown as a fallacy, only an illuminated and accepted truth is the only one that matters, to the point that it can almost negate every experience up to that point, reshaping it through a newfound lens. Given the right situation, the right story, anyone can be shaped into snake. Even rookies can fight like men of experience. The most fascinating thing about Sons of Liberty is how it simultaneously morphs the world of the game and our world without dissecting the two. Rather, they operate one in the same. One can't function without the other. And from the perspective of Kojima as a creator, it seems that in many ways, it's a desperate cry from the utter fallacy that is gaming itself. There's a need to gain player satisfaction. But is it possible to reframe people's perception, to divert it away from what they believe they wanted into something that they didn't want? But was it for that precise reason that it became an even more significant piece? Raiden is shown to be a lesser version of Snake. He even always shows up to places slightly after him. How can we take seriously from the objective lens that we're supposed to be in the shoes of an espionage expert when ultimately, we're engaging from the comfort of our own homes in a digital realm, the most trivial landscape of information that exists. It's a necessity that at the end of the game, the very fabric of the world breaks down to address us directly. We can leave behind much more than just DNA. Through speech, music, literature and movies, what we've seen, heard, felt, anger, joy and sorrow. These are the things I will pass on. That's what I live for. The profundity of its message gains clarity with the more time that passes. Its fearful proposals of a world wherein the abundance of misinformation spilling into the real landscape is a picture one no longer has to paint to understand. For perhaps it was this very mindset the very idea that we wanted to live in this virtual reality, to play pretend so often and demand that we become the characters we so desperately want to replicate in our own lives, our avatars became our Jungian self. For it's in the finale that again, much like Spec Ops, Metal Gear exposes that we are the player and the character all in one, and that the true lens of Sons of Liberty was that of a voyeur, watching us in every step, engaging in its disguise, leaving us with the knowledge to take with us and maybe change the impending and foreboding digital landscape. We need to pass the torch and let our children read our messy and sad history by its light. We have all the magic of the digital age to do that with. The human race will probably come to an end sometime, and new species may rule over this planet. Earth may not be forever, but we still have the responsibility to leave what traces of life we can. Building the future and keeping the past alive are one and the same thing. It's an interesting thing to examine the very structure of narrative in video games. Much of what dictates art's methodology is the sense of time trapped within borders. A painting tells its story within one frame, 
utilizing the illusion of movement that signifies an impression of a story in its totality. Or in triptychs, the passage of time and various perspectives are demonstrated by the multiple panels. Cinema flows along a linear passage of time. Each film takes a specific duration in which it delineates its specific beginning and ending point. However, games utilize time differently and thus their structures alter accordingly. The time in which a game is to end is different from person to person. Therefore, pacing of a narrative is dependent on a player's ability to complete the set tasks. And it's only the designer behind these games that can judge the anticipated time between each of these set pieces. But that's not all. Video games are typically more of a piecemeal structure than other narrative mediums. In order to stimulate the player and offer them as many variances as possible on the main gameplay mechanics, game creators typically move the player through various worlds or stages. Now, if we examine this in more traditional narrative forms, the jumps from one location to another, the often large tonal shifts, would be perceived to be too excessive or jarring, because from a storytelling perspective, it's much more difficult to craft a story within a single universe and have it move at a constant pace from one place to the other as we see in games. They're far more episodic, however this can be attributed to the storytelling methods that games have to offer. Majora's Mask for instance, benefits from its denoted areas for developing the themes within its narrative. Utilising the five separate areas of Termina allows the story to develop, telling the five stages of grief through each area almost completely dedicated to a singular theme. The genius I have no mouth and I must scream also houses a similar structure. Taking five protagonists and taking their role in a simulated world created individually for them by a sadistic AI who's prolonged their lifespans in order to torture them. By structuring the game as such, we're allowed to see the individuation of each character, their flaws, their perceptions, but most importantly, what torments them the most? Benny, you know you've always been my favorite torture tool. Well, I'm giving you now a chance to stoop to new lows, to give in to your uh, bestial desires. I'm going to let you find some food to eat. I'll even repair your brain so that you can think normally again and savor the horror of your repast. I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream is about the psychological torment of its characters. Being able to take control of each of them within their personal journeys allows greater exploration of the game's themes and its ability to transmit those emotions to the player. These examples are so much more successful due to the level structure that's become synonymous with games. Very rarely can a medium deliver itself in such a segmented narrative, but to transgress this even further, let's look at Killer7. The key players behind the scenes of the four powers utilized their connections and called upon the group known as... Killer7. In Killer7, a game whose story is described by its creator in such a simplistic manner that even that in itself is an act of misdirection, utilizes its episodic structure to defamiliarize players with said structure. Killer7 tells a story from beginning to end regarding a terrorist organization and an elite task force of killers headed by a man with multiple personality disorder. However, interwoven into this story are themes that include oriental and occidental relations, religious dogma, organ harvesting, violence in media, biopolitics, and many other taboos that were almost unheard of in video games prior to Killer7. Why do they treat elders like we are such nuisance? The initial story introduced to us, we have a protagonist and an antagonist, and are given the relevant establishing information to set the groundwork for a story that we will work our way through. <laughs> However, each level in the game is a new chapter, and that foundation that was set in the prologue essentially dissipates. What remains is a compilation style of narration in which we're introduced to new settings, new characters, 
and are even treated to brand new art styles with each passing chapter. We are the Punishing Rangers! The Handsome Men! Sorry, but your stupid series ends today. And if we're to hone in on the narrative at a deeper level, each chapter is a self-contained story within itself. However, even during these chapters, we're disrupted at every turn, offered allegorical and symbolic moments that are so jarring, they completely shift where our focus previously lay. Bullshit! Enough of the caviling! This is pathetic! Hey, yo! Cheater! That's a foodie ten! <laughs> you got no hand! What? Shit! It's all over. Our context of the story is constantly altering due to the fact that the already complex story adds layers of further convolution and we attempt to find a binding thread to tie it all together. One moment we're finding thematic connections until we're blindsided by a cutscene or an interaction so disconnected, how we interact with everything that follows is through a new lens. With each new disruption, our perception of the piece changes once more. Yet it's not only the chronology that serves to ostracize the players of Killer7, it's a piece that when examining its relation to other gaming conventions, you may be inclined to believe that it's a game that holds contempt for its audience. First of all, the game is aggressively linear, going as far as to have movement not utilized by the control stick, but by the press of a single button. You're literally running on rails and merely choosing which corridors to go down. You find yourself in minimalist and oppressively cell shaded worlds where all the details have been wiped out, solving puzzles that seem so abstruse that sometimes the only way to solve them is to speak to the strange apparitions that appear before you. Killer7 is a game that at every chance it gets, it transgresses what's expected of a game. Why? Because the story it's telling requires exactly that. There is a core story at the heart of Killer7, and although it seems as though it's buried beneath waves of nonsense, we must look at it with a more clinical eye. So this is dirty politics. The presidential election is in the hands of the education ministry. They manipulate the votes and bring forth political leaders. Who's he? <laughs> Greg Nightmare. He was the chairman of Education Ministry. Killer7, more than anything, highlights the artifice of what a video game is. It feels awkward to play, and thus we subconsciously question the very form of what it is that we're playing. This degree of breaking the immersion puts the form under a spotlight, forcing us to question the purpose of this object, which is what it inevitably becomes. It's a piece that has so failed in every facet of what we deem to be successful that by many standards, it could not be called a video game and is thus reduced in status to an unattributable object. And it's achieved this through pure aesthetic means. The visual style and game theory that Killer7 chooses to employ forces us to completely alter our perspective when examining its truths. This is a game about a war between two people, and if all knowledge were offered to us, we would be able to see the truth for what it really is. The world as we know it is made up of anime, religion, video games, crime, and everything in between. And in the new interconnected world, who's to say that all of these elements are exclusive to the segments of society in which they reside? Suda51 suggests that this is a failure in the art of aesthetic presentation. A more truthful expression would be to remove that which doesn't matter. The details. We must become defamiliarized with the notions of how we currently perceive the world. 
the meta game moments within Killer7 highlight even further the unreality of the medium, to the point where in a battle sequence, no matter what you do, it's already predetermined as to what the outcome will be. This is because reliance on a medium to give answers when it's so intrinsically restrictive is a lost cause. Every moment in Killer7 forces us to reframe our own perspectives, reminding us that at these moments when we feel as though we understand what this world is made of, it presents us with a hidden appendage of something we couldn't possibly have envisioned. Such is life. All life flows into one another. As distant as certain factions may seem, we can't bypass the influence that one subject has on another. They in essence exist within one another. The girl's an avid gamer. Her world of games and the real world coexist as one. All the multiple stories of Killer7 exist in this ethereal omni-narrative, just as all the personalities exist within one vessel. And at the end, we're in the future, experiencing the exact same thing over and over again. All these things are cyclical, and we will never recognize them fully unless our lens shifts completely. Alongside the nature of a story being told in sequences, what can be done about the arrangement of those sequences in order to display a thematic progression? A large portion of what people would say is the joy of video games is the sense of discovery they're able to instill. You are the one who is skillful enough or fortunate enough to find those areas and details that reveal something much deeper that the world has to offer. Metroid Prime offered a truly unique manner in which game narrative was to be experienced by the player. The narrative was almost completely subdued, allowing the world to unfold through the pages of lore ready to be discovered at the player's discretion, and an atmospheric infused world, insinuating through the isolation of a world that once was. This can be seen as a question of storytelling through design, which was the case for the masterpiece Silent Hill 2, offering a world built from the psychological trauma of the protagonist. A town which manifests itself as a person's greatest fear is also a masterclass in transmitting the Jungian fears of sexuality, abandonment and suffering throughout every facet of the world. It's hot as hell in here. You see it too. For me, it's always like this. But what if, upon discovering a world, a logic was formed that led to an even deeper ambiguity, that the more you discovered, the more questions were posed? Such is the case for Miyazaki's Dark Souls series. To leave the undead asylum in pilgrimage. To the land of the ancient lords. Lordran. Dark Souls begins with a cutscene vaguely transcribing the history of the world and the major players involved in it. From there, you're destined to work your way through the world without any guidance, with multiple paths to follow, choosing exactly how you want to tackle it. However, the thing is, many people may play through Dark Souls and be completely alienated to its narrative. They may have no idea exactly what they're doing. They hear rumblings of a fire and some recurring character names, yet the purpose as to what is happening remains a mystery. Chosen undead, your fate is to succeed the great Lord Gwyn, so that you may link the fire, cast away the dark, and undo the curse of the undead. The Dark Souls' narrative style hinges on the player integration to the world. How deep is the player willing to travel and to what degree can ambiguity influence their decisions and opinions? The narrative of Dark Souls revolves around a cyclical world, a world that repeats its cycles over and over again, avoiding its frighteningly slow decline to death 
and the darkness that is to follow. But the events that initiated this have been and gone. The great wars and legends that the world is built off has passed generations ago. Now all that remains are whispers, remnants. The Age of Fire was founded by the old gods, sustained by the linking of the fire. But the gods are no more, and the all-powerful fire deserveth a new heir. We're not given the first-hand information of what occurred, and even if it's claimed to be that, the information we're given is often contradictory. Hints towards where items came from, the sculptures and architecture that form the landscape, the very design of the beings from all corners of this universe nudge the player in the correct direction of the truth. Lord Gwyn trembled at the dark, clinging to his age of fire and in dire fear of humans and the Dark Lord who would one day be born amongst them. Lord Gwyn resisted the course of nature by sacrificing himself to link the fire and commanding his children to shepherd the humans. Gwyn has blurred your past to prevent the birth of the Dark Lord. We must be proactive in figuring out said truth. However, so much ambiguity is present that we must also rely on instinct and assumption to fill out the logic of the world. Dark Souls is a world fraught with death. The world and all its inhabitants are decaying in one form or another. Trapped in an endless cycle of life and death, the immense weight of the universe's temporality plagues us at every moment. Quailag, my dear sister, the eggs, it hurts. They've gone still. The endless deaths we ourselves endure typify the same mentality that even after a completion of the game's main story, we return back to the beginning and go through it all again. And when we're victorious after the constant slogging attempts, we achieve a strong overcoming of obstacles, but triumph isn't necessarily the present emotion that's sustained. We're not greeted with any victorious theme, just silence, brought immediately back into the world of hopelessness. For Dark Souls amalgamates the entirety of its visions into a real world for the player to explore. Its incredible aesthetic may be what shines to those who gaze upon it, yet it's its unique design in both gameplay and visuals that coincide with its storytelling. The story of Dark Souls ends with the player defeating Gwyn, a distantly remembered king responsible for the impermanent state of the world. Defending the last flame, the only remnants of the kingdom he built and subsequently destroyed. And at the end of the final game in the trilogy, we encounter the soul of Cinder, an amalgamation of all those that had linked the fire previously. However, after the hundreds of hours and deaths put into this trilogy, what do we find? That the final incarnation we must defeat once more is Gwyn. we find ourselves in our final moments right back at the beginning. No matter what is to happen, the world of Dark Souls is destined to be an inescapable realm of the morose. The information we know about the world is scattered. The memories fade in and out of view. The knowledge passes through permeable truths. The finale finds us wherein the entire world has coalesced, past, present and future. And this is the crux of the philosophy behind Dark Souls' storytelling. The storytelling has no linearity to it. There's a fluidity of its knowledge where its principles of design are prioritized more than anything else. There's a sensibility within its approach where emotion through insinuation is evoked. Thus began the Age of Fire. But soon the flames will fade, and only dark 
will remain. Miyazaki tells the entirety of the story of Dark Souls without actually telling the story. It's like seeing segments of a painting through a keyhole. You have only portions to play with, so how can that emotion fully convey itself? In Dark Souls, it's by offering anecdotes, segments of myths and legends, junctures of a character's story, parts but never the whole. And it's this system which is applied so that every facet of this dying world could be translated across to the player. Dark Souls altered the landscape of game design in every conceivable way, for it wasn't enough to create a new aesthetic for games, it was crucial to convey every emotion of helplessness, death and inevitability into every mechanic, every artistic input to create a piece that would not only elevate itself, but elevate the art form as a whole. Well, what are you going to do? I've already decided I don't really care. I'm simply crestfallen. Most games intend to keep the players playing, whether it's an online game that operates on the level of competition or on the basis of single player achievement that individuals can challenge themselves. Whether it be business or personal decisions, most developers want players to get the best value for their purchase. But this in itself sets up a very consumer supplier mentality, not necessarily what should immediately be thought of when it comes to art. An art piece has some sense of experience to it, particularly a piece that revolves around the concept of narrative. So if that's the case, what's the totality of experience with a video game? In essence, when does the video game end? It in turn seems appropriate to end this look at the video game medium with Nier Automata. Now to discuss the narrative and thematics of Nier Automata alone is a mammoth task in itself. Nier is a game following two androids attempting to rid the earth from machines that were sent here by aliens. It incorporates the cliches of mecha anime, gothic inspired fashion and many character action games. However what immediately grabs you is the presentation of the game itself. You're treated to inventive character design and perhaps the greatest soundtrack to ever feature in a video game. And before you know it, existential themes begin to fuel the narrative more than anything else. Of course, many of these themes aren't groundbreakingly new. Themes of cybernetic sentience and consciousness have been deeply explored in the cyberpunk genre and the works of Philip K. Dick. However, this exploration is by no means shallow. We begin to encounter characters with rather familiar names, but as opposed to simple name dropping, pre-established philosophy is what's used as a framework for Nier's narrative, and all are placed with the same equivalents and pitted against one another. For in the world of Nier, like all good science fiction, it uses the world as to what it could be to discuss the world of now. A world with no humans in it discusses, perhaps better than any other game, the story of humanity. It would be a long and reductionist thing if I were to explain how the narrative of Nier plays out. However, I can summarise it and discuss the importance of its method. Nier Automata features machines whose existence was seemingly meaningless, and thus in order to gain purpose, they imitated the now extinct humans. Regardless of the functionality of what it is they do, they manage to segment from one another 
and create monarchies, religions, democracies, and so on. They even managed to develop families without having the capabilities of procreation. But the importance of each machine's purpose stems from a specific point. The machines were programmed by aliens with one purpose, to defeat the enemy. However, at the point in which the machines were close to their goal, they managed to gain self-awareness. How did this emerge? For if the machines were to achieve their programmed purpose, they would immediately become obsolete. There would be no enemies for them to defeat, thus they either had to create new enemies or not fulfill their task. This inner conflict developed their self-awareness and ultimately disconnected the machines from their network, that which established their hive mind programming. They broke away into factions and developed their own purposes. Marx and Engels are giant factory-like machines who create workers whose purpose is to work. Kierkegaard is a robot that establishes upon death the machines are to become as gods themselves. The machines derived their purposes from humanity and each faction gave them a singular purpose. That singular purpose is what their sole purpose would be and they would strive to diligently and single-mindedly pursue that goal by all means. Yet as this rich and diverse world of contradictions and uncertainty unfolds around us, we play as the androids. The androids that were knowingly based from humans, whose similarly sole purpose is to destroy the enemy. And we as players are also given one object. Finish the game. The major theme that I can derive from Nier is a sense of self-defined purpose. The conflict within the game is all internal, and it's that internal conflict which allows all of the characters to give themselves a goal which they can devote their life to achieving. However, much like the inciting incident that manifested this mindset, what would happen if you, the player, ultimately achieved that goal? Is it likely that the goals in which the machines bestowed on themselves were ultimately unachievable? thus never having to acknowledge the unavoidable conclusion, which is that life is purposeless. Many of the machines which don't devote themselves to a greater ideal do end up achieving their much simpler goals and in complete self-recognition of themselves, commit suicide. The machines mutate and evolve through much more monstrous transformations in order to maintain some manner of purpose. And although looking at this perspective, we begin to feel a sense of ennui, near is anything but pessimistic. <laughs> Nier shows us that although the search for truth is an inescapable facet of life, it's often fueled through the immateriality of living, trapping ourselves in logical loops. The metaphysical conflicts of why we're here, what our purpose is that have emerged throughout human history, are all on display. Every perspective that exists is all around us, purpose through beauty, through art, they're all here and all equally inconsequential. The experience of Nier is the totality of human existence. We see things not only from the perspective of our main protagonist, but from the perspective of the side characters, a character that's not as physically powerful, but much more grounded in his deeper understanding of the machines, and that very same immateriality which becomes more exposed to us. We only see the internal after we see the external, and our perspective on what we knew before changes. Our perception of the antagonists is altered once we witness they too attempt to learn from the humans. 
知性を得ることができたらしいガタガタ言わずに黙って食べろ分かったよ兄ちゃんが言うのなら食べるよでもこれが終わったら一緒に遊んでくれるああ<笑>じゃあ頑張って食べるよ This is a complex narrative. Its allegiance is ever changing, and your understanding of the world always feels more incomplete the more you delve into it. Because you're playing a game. This isn't real life, it's art. And this piece of art is not only about to change your perspective on the art form itself, but hopefully be something that you can take into the world with you. <laughs> Who are you? And what are you doing? Yes, all the questions that Nier Automata raises are intriguing and thought provoking, but so what? It's just a game. Nier even goes out of its way to show you just how much of a game it is. You can level up your character, you have your hacking minigame. We even have moments where the presentation evokes old side scrollers and the classic arcade shoot em ups. It's just a game. You play it until it ends, and then it's over. The credits roll, and you're done. But you're not done. In fact, you've only just scratched the surface. You can keep playing, and you may run into more and more endings. The game has ended. It's ended numerous times. If you would like, that can be your ending. You can choose to see that that was how the narrative ended and treat it like any other game. But we're talking about how a game ends. Not in its narrative, but in its relation to you, the player. The further you progress, the more endings of Nier you bypass, until you reach a moment in which you, like the machines, must acknowledge the awareness of yourself and your own purpose. You must wish that things could be different, even though you accept that they can't be. Both of these decisions are made, and you then go through an unwinnable section in which you're able to salvage some of your data. However, the only way to reach the finale of Nier is to delete the entirety of your save game. But in doing so, your data will be able to assist someone else going through Nier that reaches that same point of acceptance and your personal message to them will be displayed. You'll be able to help someone that valued the narrative enough to see it through to the end, just like you. Your data after that will be permanently wiped, never to have existed. All of the work, all of your adventures in the game world are over, and all that remains are your memories of it. Because that is the nature of art. Every time you engage with it, it will be different, but that initial experience, that true experience, will always remain and is unchangeable. Near for everyone that played it can never be that experience again. You have the option to play it through again. But the experience is already there and can't be renewed. The knowledge that you have is your memory. The machines perceived dying as to be a remnant of being human. To die was to be more human, to be more you, to be God. You were the God of this world and that prophecy has been fulfilled. The God has been killed and no longer existed. This is not an anti theological message sent by the game. More so, one that emphasized the importance of your individual experience. Not only the knowledge that you gain from that, but what you're going to do with it. Just as you were the architect of this world, so are you the architect of your own. Video games are no longer meant to be modes of passive entertainment, they're to be utilized to create something greater than ourselves. Nier shows us that the human condition is messy and fraught with contradictions. And our purpose is to be derived from our experiences. Nier is but one of those experiences. It gives us the vision of art as not something to be engaged with passively, 
but something to take with us into the wider world. Nier does not have to be played again by someone that's already played it. All of what is there will still remain, but no matter how much we ignore or respond to, there's no answer for our purpose. We must take our own experiences and create something valuable, something meaningful. The greatest art is not to divulge answers for us, but to open up the realms for new lines of questions. Nier acknowledges the philosophical devotion of many people. One person that it doesn't mention is the great author Leo Tolstoy, who I'd like to quote. If I were told to write a novel in which I could establish the correct view of social questions, I wouldn't bother spending two hours on something like that. But if someone told me that what I write now will be read by today's children 20 years on, and that they will laugh and cry over it and come to love life, then I will devote my whole life and all my powers to it. This is the purpose of art, to evoke a love of life, not to enlighten us to absolute meaning, but to offer us potential, to bring the immaterial into the material. Amongst the existential dread and fear in there, we're left with one feeling. We'd like to thank Mubi for sponsoring this video. Mubi is a curated streaming service, an ever-changing collection of hand-picked films from new directors to award winners from everywhere on earth. Beautiful, interesting, incredible movies, and always carefully chosen by Mubi curators. You can stream or download all of Mubi's movies anytime, on any screen, any device, anywhere. Right now on Mubi UK, you can watch the Pusher trilogy by Nicholas Winding Refn. The Pusher Trilogy is a double debut of both Refn and Mads Mikkelsen. It explores the violent criminal underworld of Copenhagen with a crude tone to its storytelling. Shot handheld, borderline cinema verite, it's a good antidote to Refn's iconographic style of his more recent films. Go to Mubi to also check a lot of films we recommend in our essays. Mubi is the perfect gateway to world cinema and the only streaming platform the cinema cartography fully recommends. You can try Mubi for free for 30 days at mubi.com slash cinemacartography for a whole month of great cinema for free.